I think it goes back to what Woody Allen said that, you know, success is like 90% showing up. I, uh, I'm from New York, so I grew up, I mean, spitting distance from this office. A woman said to me, you know, you might like advertising. You're, you know, you've, you've got you know, a good sense of humor and you're a good writer. Um, I mean, just based on my, you know, um, sales reports and uh, sure. <laughs> whatever else I was you're doing. Getting creative. <laughs> uh, oftentimes there were assignments that were not great assignments. And, you know, what was kind of, you know, one person's shitty assignment was like my gold. So I was like, wow, I get to actually make something. So I, I just worked on everything. When someone didn't want to work on something, I'm like, I'll work on that. One day, my boss at the time had kind of blown up. He just said, you know what, I have had it. I'm out of here. It was right around the time when Nissan had uh, done a joint venture with Renault. It was a huge moment for the brand. And the Japanese executives were all coming to LA. My boss had quit that morning. So Lee Cloud, you know, turns to me and he's like, well, he's out, I guess you better do the meeting. And it was kind of like, what, me? <laughs> you what, know, year, what year was this? This is 1999. So uh, yeah, Lee said, you know, you gotta run the meeting now. So our Japanese colleagues came in and uh, I just kind of presented them in a vision for Nissan. My name was Rob and my boss's name was Rob. So they didn't really know that I wasn't that Rob. They just knew me as Rob. So they just assumed that, uh, you know, I was the boss. And uh, I did the meeting and it went great. And uh, next thing I know, I was on a plane to Tokyo and we started to build this brand together. In the late 90s, uh, where you did have kind of international brands. Sure, Pepsi was an international brand, but a global brand, meaning, oh, there was a vision that was then deployed, a singular vision deployed across the world. That was global. International was we're in a lot of places. Global was we're a single vision in a lot of places. And I think that's kind of the beginning of our business, where brands start to become global. And I think it becomes very important as you fast forward to today because there is no non-global brand. Every brand is global. What are some of the challenges then these global brands have when it comes to engaging consumers in, in really real ways, you know, having conversations? How, how does that then happen on this global stage when there's so much distance? Yeah, well, I think the most important thing for a global brand these days is you need a vision that is relevant to who you are and relevant to people. If you don't have an idea uh, of who you are or an idea of, of, of how you can be of value to somebody, then you're really behind. I think once you have the idea, if I look at something like Gatorade, you know, win from within, this is, an, uh, this is a, you know, a line that we created for them. Win from within is so relevant to the brand because you ingest yeah. this liquid, right? And there are athletes everywhere. And while the pitch may change, you know, the sporting pitch that is may change, uh, the marketing pitch doesn't because athletes all need to have something within them, both physically uh, and emotionally, to achieve at the highest level. So a universal idea is probably the most important thing. And then once you have that, you can, you can activate that. You know, again, sticking with Gatorade, sometimes you have to uh, jump in on a conversation about sport. Uh, sometimes you can just be on the sideline. Uh, sometimes you can create a piece of content that becomes a destination. But either way, it's the story of uh, winning from within, and Gatorade is a part of it. We all point y'all never there. Keep your eyes peeled, monsters in every way. We've had these, this, this career spanning lots of different clients, lots of different uh, you know, situations. How do you define it? How do you define a brand? Wow, that's, okay. that's a good one. Um, how you show up and, and how you uh, deploy your philosophy. So uh, a brand like McDonald's, you know, who I've worked on quite a bit, you know, McDonald's shows up to, 
you know, oftentimes just bring people together. You know, what Nissan does is create, you know, amazing cars. But why they do it is because they want to excite you. You know, they want to thrill you at every turn. You know, what Apple makes are these, you know, brilliant tools uh, to either showcase creativity or bring the, the creativity out in you. And, 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 and why do they do that? Because they want you to, to, to live the best life you can. So I think you know brands these days. It's it's about what you make and and why you make it. That philosophy you spoke about, it's really very interesting because it almost drives us towards this more authentic approach to the way that we do things. How do you, as an agency, guide people through that process of either understanding or coming back to or staying true to that philosophy that really should drive everything that they do? Well, yes, authenticity, I think, is, is a great word now because it's got a lot of power. You don't, you don't want a brand that is somehow uh, false in any way because it would speak ill of you as a, as a consumer. So, uh, you know, one of the things we just did that's very powerful uh, was for Michelin. You know, what we did was we just found authentic film of people, you know, oftentimes their film selfies, their own movies of them receiving their first car. And if you think about that, uh, that emotion, that feeling of what it's like when, you know, you saw this object that was going to be your ticket to freedom and you, and you knew that, wait a minute, this is mine now? and the exuberance of that. It was a, it, it's a series of very authentic moments. And what's amazing about it is that Michelin, you know, is obsessed with safety. They want people to have wonderful mobile lives in the safest way possible. So we took this very authentic moments, we assembled it together on a piece of film, and we just put at the end, we said, you know, you've made them happy, now keep them safe. And just the Michelin logo. And as you watch the film, it's so real. And what's amazing about it too is that you get the people who are in the, the, the film itself telling their friends, oh, I was just in this film for Michelin. So suddenly the authentic piece takes on a life of its own where the stars of the piece have their own tribes that they want to start to participate. And at the end of the film, we also did a hashtag. It says hashtag first car moment. So within the first uh, you know, three or four days, we got a volume of material of people saying, hey, here's my first car. Hey, this is what we did. This is my picture. My first car was this. So suddenly a little piece of film starts to go like this. And all of a sudden it's super relevant and it's super authentic. And that to me is a great example of modern brand behavior. But what do you think makes them want to get involved in something like that? There's something about when people see themselves in some way, there's something you know, in us as humans where we go, oh, I see myself, I want to play. I don't know, maybe this is like the most ridiculous analogy, but I, there's, again, if you, just, if, you, if you just watch human behavior, watching animal behavior, they're delighted by the fact that the animals are doing things that they do. Oh, look at that, uh, that person, you know, that monkey you know, doesn't want to share his banana. I'm like that, I don't want to share my pizza, whatever it is, and they see themselves. So I think when you ask kind of what's in it for people, I think what's in it for people is that they can be in it. You know, it's like what Shakespeare said, all the world's a stage. Social media is a stage. I think people are changing. Do you think generations are changing the way that they interact with brands or the way they interact with each other? I think some things are changing and some things are, are eternal. I think what's really changing is our attention spans. It used to be about 12 seconds that you could engage with something without being prompted. Uh, and now it's down to, I think, eight seconds uh, and, it's, and it's slipping faster. Yeah. So I think our attention spans are definitely changing. We're losing our bandwidth to have a lot of brands in our life. You know, I think you could have, I think even as much as 10, 10, maybe 10 years ago, you could have a lot of brands in your life. But I think now it's like, you need the one iconic brand per commodity. Okay. You know, who's my shoe brand? You know, who's my, uh, beverage brand. I think that we're, we have limited tolerance for multiple brands. I think the increasing choice almost forces us to do that, to, to kind of avoid that overwhelmed feeling of, of having too much selection. Well, I think that's a great observation. I think, yeah, I think this, um, 
tyranny of choice. I mean, it sounds like a very ironic phrase, but we're overwhelmed by choice. So I love your theory that, uh, yeah, we don't have the time, so we're going to shorthand. I mean, when I went to this kind of uniform of uh, black suit, white shirt, black tie, what I found really fascinating about it was that I had reduced my time in stores, like, by tenfold. I'm just like, where are the black ties? Okay, great. Okay, that one, that one, that That's one. Amazing. And it's like, okay, I only like these kind of white shirts. I'm getting those. You know, I only like these kind of shoes now. It's done. So you wear this every day? Yeah. That's a good look to go with. <laughs> well, you're always ready. You know, client meeting, funeral, bar mitzvah. <laughs> You know, you talk about your creative days, and, and I assume you speak of them fondly. Yeah, of course. Um, what, what, what are the projects you've enjoyed working on the most? I worked on a great project for Visa. What was amazing about it was we had come up with an idea that we thought, this is it, we nailed it. And we pitched it to the client on a, on a Thursday, and they loved it, and we were moving ahead. And as we're doing the process of getting directors, it turned out that, oh, somebody did this. This, this exact same idea was done somewhere in New Zealand. And it was like, wh huh? <laughs> so we were fucked. And uh, we called the clients and told them, and they were very disappointed. And they said, well, you know, the, the clock's ticking, and you have to have something by Monday. So that Friday, that Friday night, uh, I sat around with several people, uh, and we came up uh, with an idea for the Olympics that wound up lasting the next three Olympics. Yeah. And uh, what I loved about it was I was reading a book on Olympic stories. And the way that the, the idea uh, you know, uh, unfolded was, you know, after everybody you know, said shit, fuck, you know, we're fucked you know, about a billion times, I said, you know, I'm reading this interesting book about Olympic stories. What if we told these Olympic stories? You know, and somebody immediately said, yeah, we could tell them kind of in these cool ways with still photography, like a, almost like a Ken Burns. And I just threw out, I said, yeah, maybe we'll get somebody like Morgan Freeman. You know, he's like the ultimate storyteller. Morgan Freeman will tell these stories. And bam, like within, I would say, a half an hour, we had 10 scripts. And I remember we went, we showed them to, uh, to Lee Clow uh, over the weekend. He loved them. We presented them to the client on Monday. We were in production Monday night. Yeah. And then we did this long-term campaign that, you know, was just one of the, to me, one of the best campaigns ever done for the Olympics. We had gone from the, it, we, it was the lowest point. Everything was destroyed and we had nothing and no time and really not a lot of energy within us. And we came back and made something amazing. Is that where the best ideas come from, when your back up's against the wall? Or is that just a singular case? Yeah, I think, it's, I think you know, I don't want any clients to know that. <laughs> <laughs> they, should, they should beat the crap out of us to, uh, to get it right. the best ideas come from as a strategy. What I do know is that I have some good techniques for when you're stuck. One thing that's great to do is that when you get really stuck, do a 180. Meaning that if the project's about uh, a sports car uh, and driving fast and motion and all that, and you're stuck because that feels very conventional, the disruption's gonna happen if you do the 180. So you go, well, what happens if we don't move? What happens if things are still? What happens? So I remember working on a minivan project and it was like, well, what happens instead of minivans being so practical, what if we made them sexy? <laughs> uh, another great technique if you're stuck is what I like to call, it, it's forced creativity. So tell the teams that are working, you need to do a five by five. Five ideas by five o'clock. That's it. No, no ifs, ands, or buts. The trick to our business is that uh, you sometimes have to just keep talking and keep it, you know, keep writing till sudden, you know, suddenly someone goes stop. That's it. And then the, I think the other thing that's very good—it's a very personal way to get out of a out of a problem. And you can do this in life; it's not just uh, you know solving uh, marketing problems. Uh, write three pages. So take a decent-sized notebook, go away from everybody, and just write three pages. Don't edit it. Don't try to make it fancy, and then share it with somebody. And nine times out of 10, someone's gonna look at your three pages and go, ah, that's the idea. I'm chasing excellence. I know that sounds like, I, 
God, I almost feel like David Brent on The Office. <laughs> what, what do you think the advertising agency of the future looks like? Well, I think the thing that agencies do better than anybody else in the world is clarify what brands do, synthesize a lot of material, simplify what the ideas, uh, you know, all these things are, make it very simple, uh, and then package it in a way that, that people want to hear it. And I think no matter what the technology uh, breakthroughs there are, no matter how many different omni-channel, no matter how many, how many more channels and how much more omni it becomes, you still need the idea to fill the omni and the channel. So the idea and the, the crystallization of a brand into an idea, that's our value. What do brands need to do to stay relevant, to stay different, to stay engaging, to, to keep that cut through? You mentioned disruption, you know, the perfect mm -hmm. word. Well, I think the first thing that brands need to understand is that their competition isn't necessarily only other brands. Uh, their competition is my need to go look at my phone. Right? I need to look at my phone now, right? People are obsessed with looking at their phone. So it's wonderful that you've got a brand new whiskey. I think that's phenomenal. But what do you have to do with me looking at my phone? And if you knew, if every brief said, our agenda is to keep everyone from looking at their phone, that's probably the best brief I, I, I'd ever see. Sure. Right? I just made that up. I, I mean, I've never had that brief before. I'm going to give that to some people now. <laughs> There's so much uh, competition for... Uh, the world of distraction. Everybody's got their agenda, everybody's got the things they're trying to do in life, and everything else is distraction. Now some distraction is virtuous, and it's a distraction that can yeah. uh, be a utility for your life in some way, but other bits of distraction are just distracting. It's a really simplified way of looking at it. Yes, yeah, distraction is the... <laughs> <laughs> the distraction is the, the competitor. Yeah, I just invented that. There you go, you saw it here first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do this thing too with, uh, I'm doing it for creative criteria, um, for our creative directors, uh, and I'm doing it as creative criteria for our clients. And that's a very simple way to judge something. So if I show you an ad, you, you, can, only, you can only have one of three responses. The first response you could say is you could go, yes, I get it, okay, great. The other response you could say, if you don't say yes, is you could say no, I don't like it, I hate it. In fact, I may even go on social media and say bad things about sure. it. But the third thing you can say is, wow. When you show something that's really amazing, people naturally say that word. Or they, they lean in or their jaw drops and they just feel something. And I think if you could make somebody feel something and if you can make that thing that is wow, mm. that goes from distraction to uh, attraction. Because you're, oh well, wow, what is that thing? It's interesting. I mean, you, you talk a little bit about methodologies and frameworks, and it seems to be, uh, just in the way you're kind of articulating your answers, is, is that just how you think? Is that something very centric to the way the agency operates? Well, I'm a big believer in having constraints to liberate. You know, we want something breakthrough. There are two dynamics that are kind of forcing methodology. The first is time. So we don't have a lot of time. We need ideas by five o'clock today, do a five by five. We don't have a lot of time. So write three pages this morning and tell me what you've got by lunch. We don't have a lot of time. So these are the first ideas you have. Good. What? Give me a 180 because we don't have time. So that's one dynamic that's forcing uh, methodology. The second dynamic that's forcing methodology um, is that we have one in this company called disruption. And What's interesting about disruption is that it's, it's very intuitive, right? If you were to approach any given problem, you'd say, well, what's everybody done before? What's, what's going on now? Like, what, what, are the, what are the conventions? And then you might say, okay, so what's the objective? Like, what's the vision? What does this thing want to be? Okay, good, so now you're two thirds of the way there. You've got a vision, you know the competitive landscape. Disruption is the thing that you go, ah, this new thought, it's going to break those conventions to leapfrog us to the vision. So that's kind of why there's a lot of methodology. It's a way to get to yeah. cool stuff faster.
How do you turn that philosophical conversation that, that happens very easily at the agency level to something that happens company side and, and can then be replicated to, to every level? Having these, I, I'd probably call it just based on what we're chatting about here, an operating philosophy. Sure. Because to have a philosophy, sometimes it feels airy-fairy and it feels like, you know, you know, the ops guys, you know, they're not, we don't have a philosophy. We're just trying to grind, you know, the numbers down and be efficient and effective, you know. And, but an operating philosophy, you know, that's something that is very powerful. Sometimes I feel like when we go into rooms and we've clarified something and simplified it, there's a skepticism that, well, that's too simple. That, that hasn't captured us, you know. I mean, could you imagine Apple going, yeah, I think different. I mean, it's cute, but <laughs> I wish it was more complicated. And I do think sometimes, I guess it's the best way to frame it up. There's a skepticism to something that's too simple. But, I mean, we spend our lives as, uh, you know, reductionists. We're constantly trying to reduce the complexity of these brands to find something that's clear that they can use on a minute by minute basis that is relevant to uh, to yeah. a consumer. I mean, that's that's what you really want. I mean, if I go, you know, just go back to Gatorade because I think it's a very good example. Win from within, I get it. And Powerade is, I don't have that. Sure. So I think you've got to find those um, beliefs, like whatever, whatever you want to call it, a brand belief that can then easily translate into, oh, that's how we should behave. We used to always kind of summarize our brands, like what's the belief and then what's the behavior? And every brand needs that. Every brand needs, what's your belief and how should you behave off that brand? Beanie, beanie, bitchy, they need it, it's time for freaky, freaky. The devil tried me, so I put them underneath me. Uh, I do not surrender, choose, kill me, not free me. Move